it's uh, a pleasure to be here. So welcome everyone. Uh, it's lovely to give this talk in conjunction with the Dancing in Fetters exhibition, which is still on show upstairs on the top level. Uh, it's very fitting that the exhibition is here, given that this is one of only two convict built buildings still in existence in Queensland. So thank you very much to the Royal Historical Society of Queensland for hosting it and the Australian Government's Visions of Australia for funding the tour. My name is Heather Clark. I'm a cultural historian. And today I'm accompanied by my uh, musical director, Roland. He's up the back there. He's going to come and play a couple of tunes later on. Uh, so the Dancing in Fetters exhibition is the result of a lifetime study of historical dance and my doctoral research into convict culture at the Queensland University of Technology. Okay. One of the aims of historical research is to provide new perceptions and illuminating insights. The notion of convicts having a life which included music and dance is strikingly at odds with the prevailing popular image of convict heritage. Historians were aware from a number of sources that popular culture had been established very early in colonial Australia and we knew that dancing had been reported as one of the most popular of pastimes. However, very little was known about the details of this culture. When I began the research into this area, I had no idea if I'd be able to find enough information to even begin the project. And I've been amazed at the amount and the depth of information I've been able to find. So first of all, I'll begin with just a very brief outline of what we know about the history of social dance. So if you're going to look for social dance history before the 20th century, this is what you'll find. A beautiful picture of ballet, and then you'll find a high-class ballroom with Welsh people dancing in the latest fashions. And the history of dance is primarily about these elite forms of dance. There's very little written about the social dances of ordinary non-privileged people, even though this was the most prevalent, one of the most prevalent forms of recreation. There are various reasons why in the past dance had not been the focus for serious research. To begin with, it is difficult to describe and the movements are difficult to capture in illustrations. In the academic world, the brain was regarded as the seat of intelligence and the body was considered just a vehicle to carry it around. Anything associated with the emotions and physicality was not considered worthy of study. At certain times, this was heightened by people viewing the body as being the font of all sorts of sinful desires. And there's a lovely example a perfect example in an article in the Sydney Gazette um, from 1827 where it talks about the evils of unlicensed public houses and it says the youth of both sexes are attracted to these dens of destruction by the vivid excitation of animal spirits which music and dancing and unrestrained mirth produces. I don't think you find that in the paper today. <laughs> but some people really did view dancing as an unwholesome activity. And this was especially the case when the upper classes witnessed the dances of those at the opposite end of the social scale. Their lack of refinement was considered as vulgar and crass and not something to study or record. In recent years, this has changed, however, and the understanding that dance is actually highly significant in all human societies. And this has opened many new avenues of research. 
Scientists have also began to investigate the neuroscience behind dance and have found some remarkable results. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So what do we know about social dance history? In attempting to work out how people danced in the early years of the Australian colony, I've looked at the traditions and background to dance leading up to this period. Dance was certainly integral to social life in the British Isles for all levels of society, from the rural, from the royal court through to the slums of London. The group dance, called the English country dance, was the most pop popular form of social dance from the late 16th century right through to the early 19th century. The other dance form which was popular at the time was the percussive dance form, known as a step dance. These were re generally referred to as jigs and hornpipes, the forerunners to tap dancing. This type of noisy dance, though extremely prevalent amongst the groundlings, was regarded as completely inappropriate in the polite ballroom. So where do we find information about convicts dancing? I began by looking for common people in Britain during this period. Given that there's very little written about this, I had to spread the net as widely as possible. And one of the prime places I discovered was the online resource which claims to be the largest body of text detailing the lives of non-elite people ever published. And this is the Old Bailey Court Proceedings. Now, you might not think that this would contain much information about dancing. It's not as though dancing was illegal or that you could steal it. But people did steal dancing shoes and affronted dancing masters. But more information actually came from the evidence about the whereabouts of the accused. For instance, I was at a dance in the tap room when I saw the prisoner dancing a reel. The court transcripts are very factual and unadorned, revealing a great deal about dancing. When, where, and occasionally what they were dancing. Then I turned my attention to British prisons. Obviously, most prison records don't record dancing, though occasionally a writer might include details about the conditions and the lifestyles of the prisoners. Prisons changed enormous, enormously over the period between 1788 and 1840, but certainly in the late 18th and early 19th century, they were places where people could sing drink and dance. In the story of the Warden's Room by Charles Dickens, he gives a detailed description of a prisoner dancing a hornpipe in the Fleet Prison. As a child, Dickens visited his father in the debtor's prison, and it's assumed that this story is drawn from his own experiences there. So this is where the this illustration comes from. But also, the floor plans of prisons in this area, era also show that tap rooms, that's bars, were, were included where the inmates and their family and friends could gather for amusement and refreshment. Again, that's uh, not something that happens today, the whole, uh, the whole attitude to um, prisons has changed enormously. Often the next venue for a convict awaiting transportation was a hulk. These were the prison ships moored in the Thames and the coastal towns in England and Ireland. The hulks had the reputation of being the worst types of prison. Yet even here, there are accounts of dancing. Central convicts were interviewed during the commission in 1823 and stated that in the evenings, after they'd been locked in for the night, 
it was a regular practice to dance. On one folk, they danced to the music of the clarinet and two fiddles and a bass. On ships bringing the convicts to Australia, it seems to have become a common practice for the surgeons who supervise the well-being of the convicts to encourage dancing as a regular activity. Surgeons were required to keep medical journals and these reveal that some surgeons, though not all, regarded dancing as a healthy exercise for the mental, emotional and physical health and that it could bring tranquility of mind to those in their care. Surgeon Mercer on the Albion Road, whether on deck or below, I managed as much as possible to keep their minds employed by some bodily exercise. The afternoon of every day was spent in merriment and many exercises such as singing and dancing. So that's not the common view of um, convict ships, but there's the evidence um, that we can find, and it's much easier now that the um, surgeon journals are actually, um, some of them are digitized, and so we can look. It's very painstaking, but believe me, the evidence is there. Most ships carried either male or female convicts, and in these cases, and in the cases where they carried both, the groups were segregated. This means that the dancing occurred with groups of men dancing together and groups of women dancing together. It's notable that gender wasn't an issue, as the dancers were much more akin to modern day team sports, so there wasn't sort of a, a romantic um, opportunity there, it was just an activity. Once convicts arrived in the colony, dancing is reported in quite different ways. One of the earliest accounts from, comes from the officer William Bradley. He wrote about the interaction between the first fleeters and the local people. His illustration shows the marines and the sailors dancing with the indigenous people. And in other accounts, he describes the convicts dancing with the local people also who lived around the harbour. This is, is a detail. Um, it doesn't actually give a lot of information and we don't know. Uh, it looks as though the, the um, Europeans are sort of in, including the indigenous people in their dance rather than the other way around. But we know that there are instances where um, the, the white people uh, tried to learn indigenous dances. So they were, you know, they were open-minded at that stage, I think. This raises the question of convicts having time for recreation. Those with an interest in convict history will be aware that the image of all convicts leading terrible debased lives has been replaced by a more balanced view, as suggested by historians such as Grace Caskins in Sydney. Grace writes, it is now understood that the majority of convicts lived quite normal lives, and many were much better off than would have been the case if they had remained in England. Most convicts did not live in prisons and were not shackled or flogged. They were fed and clothed. Their working day finished at three in the afternoon, allowing them time to themselves for work and leisure, and they could choose where they lived. Of course, that wasn't the case in secondary penal settlements um, where convicts were sent who'd re-offended. So it was quite different in places like Morton Bay and um, Port Arthur. But for many of the assigned convicts, without the secondary offences, there was a degree of freedom. So in these less restrictive places, historians have affirmed that tavern culture was established very early. The French officer Louis Fresnay, visiting the colony in 1819, 
remarked on the excessive leisure time enjoyed by the convicts. And Commissioner Big, who came to report on the state of the colony in the 1820s, complained about the high number of public houses where dancing and fiddling took place. However, dancing wasn't confined to public houses, and it seemed that it may have been a regular part of everyday life, in addition to special events such as weddings, fairs, and even wakes. The main source of information about convicts dancing in the colony comes from the police reports in the local papers. Although its dancing itself wasn't illegal, many of the circumstances surrounding it were, and these were reported. Houses where drinking, fiddling and dancing took place were required to be licensed, otherwise they earned the title of disorderly houses. There were also curfews in place, and convicts who were taught, caught dancing without permission were in trouble. So there's a large body of information gathered from newspapers around the country. It's often written in a humorous, satirical style, which sometimes makes it difficult to, to tell whether they're actually really reporting something truthfully. In this account, Jane Marshall and Sarah Mahoney, fellow servants, were placed at the bar. The charge against these beauties was that they had walked off from their master's crib and betaken themselves to one of the genteel hops, that's a dance, that were frequently held on the rocks. They were found turning around in the soft mazes of the walls, occasionally imbibing a quarter of max to moisten their clay. So that means they were having uh, a glass of gin the appearance of the constable not a little astonished them, and they remained some time parleying, but without effect. Go they must, and go they did. They both looked very silly, as might be imagined, and still more so when they found their frolic rewarded them by six weeks each to Gordon's Dancing Academy. Now, often these, um, these accounts need interpretation. So obviously, the portent of gin is gin, uh, the max gin. Gordon's Dancing Academy is actually the paramount of female poetry, where Mrs. Gordon was the patron. Uh, we know that in female factories, where women were often sent if they were caught dancing, uh, the ones in Parramatta and Hobart, there are reports that women regularly danced, sang and play acted in these factories. And it was one of their favourite things to do. So one of the fascinating aspects of taking our exhibition on tour to convict sites around the country is searching for local content for each venue. Here in Brisbane, we have the story of Hannah Rigby. Uh, so you can read that story upstairs. She danced herself to death. That's how it was reported. And we also have a great account from the Brisbane Truth, which was written in 1915, in an article on the early history of Queensland. And it reads, some of the dames who on occasion needed some kindly police attention were relics of the convict system. These poor souls were usually quiet in their conduct and subdued in their manner, but on festive occasions they were apt to demonstrate their ability to step dance in cutty sarks or other de chavalier, which at their time of life could scarcely be accepted as fascinating undress. Now, I'm not going to dance in a cutty sark, but Roland's going to come down to the front and um, I'm going to uh, demonstrate my ability in, <laughs> in a step dance. Uh, and this is a jig, it's very short, I won't prolong it, to the tune of Paddy Carey.
to see more of that, come to the concert next Friday. Yeah, I just catch my breath for a minute. <laughs> I could have got rather to play another bird. Is that Jim? <laughs> 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 Having established that dancing was definitely flourishing in the con colony, I then looked at the way the culture was passed on. Many people have learned the dances simply by immersion, but there are also dancing masters who endeavoured to teach good manners as well as the dancers themselves. These masters generally came from their own class. So gentlemanly dancing masters taught to the upper classes and the lower order dancing masters taught within their own ranks. So the, the men at the lower end of the social scale were known as hop merchants. So this fellow is an Irish hop merchant. I've been able to identify a number of these listed in the convict index. However, they didn't advertise in newspapers as they, um, the more wealthy ones did. So it's difficult to ascertain how often they taught in the colony. The Irishman Edward Elliot and Ambrose McGuigan are in this category. They both became publicans once they were, had finished their sentences and may well have been teaching dancing in these places. At the other end of the social scale were the masters who described themselves as professors of dance. And a number of these came to the colony. The French Francois Girard and Charles, Emmanuel Charles Green, and the English dancing master Frederick White. These were the ones who taught children and aspiring ladies and gentlemen because for the privileged classes, dancing well was an important accomplishment to show you were properly educated. It meant you had both the time and the money to spend on dancing lessons in order to acquire the essential graces. And these included how to move with elegance, poise and dignity. So this was an issue in the colony where both free settlers and ex-convicts wanted to give the impression of being upwardly mobile and genteel. So convict dancing masters helped to cater for this need. Importantly in Morton Bay, in the penal settlement, there was a well-educated professor of music and dance called John Bushell. Described at his tri trial in 1827 as a fine, handsome, fashionably dressed young fellow of the highest accomplishments. He was charged with stealing a gold watch from a jeweler. Despite claiming that he had merely acted as, as an interpreter for a French gentleman and knew nothing of the crime, he was found guilty and sentenced to death. Although this was his first appearance in an English court, he had a previous conviction in France and had often masqueraded as a Spanish gentleman. So from the various accounts, it would seem that he probably wasn't innocent. However, as it was his first offence in England, his sentence was commuted to transportation for life. He arrived in Sydney on Phoenix in 1828, and three years later he was sent to the penal settlement in Morton Bay. Uh, mostly it seemed because he was an atheist and they thought he was an unsuitable person to have around. So uh, the record uh, has this statement. I'll just have to read it to you. The military officers in charge of the settlement, hearing of his knowledge of music and languages, 
gladly availed themselves of this opportunity to improve themselves. He became a great favourite and taught them music, dancing, drawing, fencing, and French, Italian, Spanish, and German languages to their great delight. Better than these dancers could have been taught in London. He now made a happy exchange from an excess of severity to an excess of kindness. So one of the dancers that he taught, Roland's going to come and play, and he taught the German waltz and the Spanish quadrille. So this is the tune for the Spanish quadrille. dancing masters usually played the music as well as talk. Uh, so they, they tended to be quite, actually quite proficient men and, and Bushel had lived in Spain so he had all these languages so he was probably quite a great asset when he came here. So after his sentence was over he married a very talented musician and singer called Eliza Wallace in Sydney and they became quite highly acclaimed but unfortunately he died when he was aged only 48 in Hobart when they were on tour. Uh, but he did have children and they went on to have very successful musical careers as well. There are very few artifacts pertaining to this intangible culture. These are the only instruments that I've been able to locate. From Norfolk Island we have a, a whistle and part of a harmonica. From the Hyde Park barracks they have a juice harp. Uh, I think they have a couple there, they're quite rusty, they'll find it under the um, floorboards when they were doing excavations and renovations. Um, and then we have a fiddle, which is in the Hawkesbury Museum, uh, and it belonged to Reuben Greentree. He came with his family when his father was transported, so they followed and we reunited here in the colony. Uh, music was generally provided by the fiddle, the most common instrument, but there are also other things like calarinets and um, um, tambourines and those sorts of things as well. A barrel organ and fife and drums, those sorts. Uh, convicts were the main providers of music in public houses and we've been able to identify 105 musicians so far and I'm sure we'll find more as we keep looking. The only known manuscript of convict music in existence belonged to Alexander Lang. He was a talented Scottish fiddler who came to the colony in 1812 and was sent to Tasmania. You can see a photocopy of the manuscript upstairs, it's in the display, uh, and the original is in the Tasmania archives. In addition to this, we have a substantial number of tunes that were reported in the newspapers. And sometimes they use uh, the title of popular tunes. For instance, my lodging is on the cold hard ground. And uh, another popular one was when they were running away, they would say they were running to the tune of off she goes. And you, you'll recognize those tunes if you hear them. Off she goes is um, actually Humpty Dumpty. Most people would recognize that as Humpty Dumpty. 
Another aspect I've used to give an understanding of convicts dancing are illustrations. There are no illustrations of convicts dancing in the colony, so I've had to rely on British sources. There are quite a lot of caricatures of lower order dancing from this period. Artists such as George Cruikshank, James Gilray, and Thomas Rowlandson like to capture everyday life, particularly in London. So we really have a fascinating legacy. Despite the fact that they're obviously not accurate depictions of dancing, they do provide a considerable amount of information. This illustration of sailors carousing is clearly a caricature, though it also shows four people dancing a reel. Which brings us to, not that way, the other way, dancing in fetters. The theatre was at the heart of popular culture. Stories, songs, music and dance, nearly all of these came from the theatre. The lower orders in Britain loved the theatre and plays were acted everywhere from London to small provincial towns, at village fairs and on ships at sea. We know convicts enacted plays en route to the colony, in convict theatres and in female factories. Most of the tunes they played and songs they sang came from the theatre. In 1728, the play The Beggar's Opera generated a great fascination with the criminal underworld. And it was a theme that was maintained well into the 19th century. The opera included in the final scene a dance for the prisoners in chains and sometimes this was danced by one of the major characters. The dance itself became a favourite act in the theatre. Consequently, when the surgeon Peter Cunningham observed that the convicts in his care danced to the jingle of their chains, they were no doubt calling to mind the romantic image of the dashing, devil-may-care theatrical criminal. So that's a... Um, how, how long have I got? Can I say a bit more? Yes, sure. Good, okay. Oh, it's okay. Um, I was going to say that um, this image of, of dancing in fetters in 1839, uh, Ainsworth wrote a story about Jack Shepherd, who'd been a uh, a criminal who was very good at escaping. So he had he was put in prison five times and had these wonderful escapes. And so they wrote a, a play about it and it became incredibly popular. And it was it came to Australia too in the 1880s. Um, and that also had this this act of dancing in fetters. Um, the play that came to Australia, you all have heard of one of the songs because it's where the well-known Old Bocking Bay song comes from. So that's not actually a really old song, it's uh, from 1880. So that was a little aside. And if you really like to, you can ask Roland to play that tune later. So now we come to the significance of dance. Although dance can seem to be the utmost of frivolous activities, there's now a significant amount of scientific research which shows why dancing has always been important for human society. Collective effervescence is a term used to describe the euphoria people experience when they are united by a common purpose. Dance is at the forefront of these activities. It's an intensely interactive activity where the individual can meld into a community. It creates a force that can lift people out of their everyday existence, bringing a temporary escape from their troubles. 
It creates a rush of neurohormones to make us feel good. In fact, it can make us feel so good that it increases our tolerance to pain. It can give us hope and cheerfulness in the harshest of situations and it encourages people to put aside grievances. Not only that, but it can act as a form of rebellion. And it was this that worried the authorities in Australia and in England. Convicts were removed from their family and friends and sent to the other side of the world. They found themselves in a completely new environment where little was familiar. One of the comforts they had was their popular culture. It gave them solace, recreation, and a way to connect to their new community. There are several reasons why this aspect of the convict experience has been lost. Primarily, the authorities at the time wanted transportation to act as a deterrent from crime. Convicts weren't supposed to be having fun. They weren't supposed to be having a good time. The establishment tried to suppress the popular culture and linked fiddling and dancing to unruly behaviour. Victorian attitudes to acceptable conduct became increasingly narrow, especially for women. And as time went on, people wanted to forget the convict stain and any connection to convict culture was intentionally ignored. In the 20th century, when folklorists began to collect music and dance from traditional players, there are almost no instances where people acknowledged a convict forebear having passed on their cultural heritage. Recovering this lost culture has been reliant on the records of those in authority who closely monitored the lives of convicts. So in conclusion, uh, the Commissariat is our first venue in our national tour and we'll be taking the exhibition to six more convict sites across Australia, including North of Ireland. I'm not sure what other part of Australia is it? Yes. <laughs> oh, Reluctantly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's funded by um, the Australian Government's Visions of Australia program and we're all sponsored by the Abbey Museum and we have a partner which is Bush Traditions. So the Bush Traditions is particularly helping with the um, public programming. So in every venue we'll have a concert and uh, workshops and other things. Uh, so we hope that this aspect of cultural heritage will be recognised as one of the few aspects of convict life that we can actually experience ourselves in a dynamic link between what's tangible and what's intangible. So next Friday, we'll be presenting our concert, which will feature convict music, song and dance. So please come along. And if you'd like more information, you can visit our website. And uh, you can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook. And you can ask me questions now.